Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to CSIS. I'm Jennifer Cook. I direct the Africa program uh, here. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to CSIS, and I want to thank the panel for, for joining this discussion. Uh, we hope this will be interactive uh, debate and discussion. Looking at some of the policy issues and policy dilemmas and policy priorities as uh, the president travels to Ethiopia and Kenya next week. Um, his fourth uh, trip as president uh, to Africa, uh, one that will has generated a lot of expectations in the, in the countries he's traveling to, and one that I think kind of highlights some of the challenges of and kind of dilemmas within U.S. policy um, the, towards these countries, each of which uh, are important security partners to the United States, uh, each of which have seen uh, fairly strong positive economic growth and, and, and investments in infrastructure, uh, trade, uh, and, and pretty strong growth rates, uh, although not without limits and not without some controversies, um, each of which has been important partners historically, and each of which is facing, uh, in certain cases, a rollback of civil liberties, um, some concern over uh, media restrictions, uh, limits on civil society, uh, counter-terror laws that have been uh, overly, uh, kind of fairly broadly interpreted. Um, and so they bring to light, I think, the various strands of U.S. policy uh, and how the White House and the President will kind of weigh these, these different policies, uh, the one against the other, and how, how, how we can base that. Um, we have here today uh, a, a great panel uh, who have spent a lot of time looking at the region as a whole, also looking at the levers of U.S. policy and the internal policy dynamics at work within the U.S. administration, Congress, business community, and so forth. So we're going to have each uh, say a few words about kind of their kind of the priority topics as they um, lessons for the president as he, as he travels, kind of the, like what they see as the important priorities on the trip, as well as analysis on the countries to which he's traveling. We're going to start with um, Mark Bellamy, uh, Ambassador Mark Bellamy, who is Warburg Professor of International Relations at Simmons College in Boston. He's a senior advisor to the Africa program here, and uh, he's former ambassador to Kenya with a long career um, in the Foreign Service, uh, serving in a number of African posts. So thank you, and we'll turn then to Terence Lyons, who is Associate Professor of Conflict Resolution at George Mason University, long-term focus on political development, transnational uh, politics, democracy and governance. Uh, Terence has spent a great deal of his career focusing on Ethiopia and done a lot of work with USAID, the World Bank, and others uh, on democracy and governance issues there. Uh, we will follow up with Sarah Prey, who is Senior po Policy Analyst for Africa in the Open Society Foundation's uh, uh, DC office. Um, Sarah, along with OSI, works with policymakers and with a, a huge network of civil society groups across Africa, uh, particularly with very strong networks in Kenya and, and Ethiopia to some extent, although I'm sure she'll talk about the challenges of that. Um, then have E.J. Wogendorn, who is with the International Crisis Groups, Africa. He's the Africa Deputy Director. Uh, previously, uh, Horn of Africa Project Director with the International Crisis Group. I'm sure you're all familiar with Crisis Group, which um, does just terrific analysis. They have a big network on the ground, uh, focusing on issues of security, conflict, peacemaking. We've asked each to, to speak fairly briefly um, because we do want to open up for discussion and debate. We're going to start with um, Ambassador Bellamy um, and uh, go down the line. To so, Ambassador Bellamy. Right. Thank, thanks, thanks very much, Jennifer. It's great to see this big crowd here today. Um, there, there are different angles uh, with uh, for viewing the President's trip to, to East Africa. Uh, there are a 
lot of issues that he could talk about at both stops, global issues, regional issues, bilateral issues. I'm going to focus my remarks today on the bilateral aspects of our relationship uh, with Kenya, why that relationship has historically been very important, how it has come under quite a bit of strain in recent years, and what, um, what few themes are probably important in the context of a reset of bilateral relations. If that uh, is a uh, if that's an objective during the president's during the president's visit, uh, I, I probably don't need to belabor the point with this audience that Kenya, that the bilateral relationship with Kenya, the U.S.-Kenya relationship has been historically a, a, a pretty important one for the United States in Africa. Just a few facts on random sort of illustrate the, the breadth of that relationship. The fact that for many years our embassy in Nairobi was our largest. Sub Saharan Africa, I don't think that's still the case, but for quite a while the embassy was the largest. Uh, our largest aid program in Africa for a number of years over the past decade was in Kenya. At one point, I think it was the fifth largest aid program globally for the United States. Um, our largest CDC presence any place in the world is in Kenya. We probably get more African students from Kenya than from any other African country, both university and graduate students, which illustrates the depth of the people-to-people -people relationships. Um, our intelligence and security relationships with Kenya are longstanding. They go back a long way. I was thinking yesterday, I don't think we've actually ever had to interrupt our security assistance flows to Kenya, except I can remember the one time I can remember was when the Kenyan government rather commendably held out against U.S. pressure to exempt U.S. service members from the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Um, and they were sanctioned under U.S. law for that, um, for that principal position, which is um, more than a little ironic given the current circumstances in Kenya. Uh, this is a this is a, an historical a deep historical relationship. During the Cold War, uh, Daniel Eric Moy was considered an ally of the United States, and he was rewarded accordingly. Uh, in the post Cold War period, Kenya emerged as uh, as a uh, as almost an island of stability in a very turbulent Horn of Africa region. And Kenya served as a hub for the United States and for other international actors as we put together interventions and programs to deal with conflict and humanitarian crises in places like South Sudan, Somalia, and Ethiopia. Uh, and after the 1998 bombing of our embassy in Kenya, Kenya became a very important partner of the United States in the um, fight against global terror, specifically the fight against Al-Qaeda in East Africa. Finally, one point uh, that I, uh, I think is important to underline and that the United States has a fairly commendable record, I believe, of protection of human rights and supporting democratization in Kenya, particularly in the 1990s. There are many Kenyans today who remember, some of them gratefully, some of them nervously, perhaps, uh, that the United States uh, funded and advised and encouraged civil society organizations who were campaigning for multi-partyism in Kenya who are campaigning for greater democratic governance. And so that's a, that is a part, it's an important part, I think, of, of our legacy in the, bilateral, in the bilateral relationship. So there's a long history there. Uh, it has come under strain in recent years. And, 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 and I think this can mostly be traced to the period just before, uh, during, and after the 2013 presidential elections in Kenya. Many of you will recall that both candidate Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto were uh, indicted by the ICC. They stood for the presidency. Um, they used, uh, they stood for, for, for office despite those indictments, and uh, they, um, they rallied their respective ethnic constituencies uh, around the idea that these ICC cases were in fact sinister plots, sinister neo-colonial plots, uh, meant to subjugate and humiliate Kenya, that Kenyans who continued to call for accountability before the ICC were in fact traitors. Um, after the election, after uh, President Kenyatta and, and William Ruto were successfully elected, um, the continuation of these ICC cases 
need a litmus test, both of uh, loyalty or how, how, how one lined up vis-a-vis -vis the ICC. It was made a litmus test of one's loyalty and patriotism at home, and a litmus test of Kenya's relationships abroad. And it was you no know, accident that the first big foreign visit of newly elected Hugo Kenyatta was to China, not to the UK or to the US. So in this somewhat poisonous post-election atmosphere, opposition groups, the media, civil society were all targeted to some degree, sometimes violently. Uh, vitriol flowed from Nairobi in the direction of Washington. Um, it included charges that the United States was funding NGOs with the aim of undermining the Kenyatta administration or even with the aim of regime change in Kenya. This was an historic low point in our relation, 2013-2014. Now, tensions and, and, and strains have eased somewhat recently, in part because the ICC case against President Kenyatta has been dropped. Also in part, I believe, because the Kenyans judged that their aggressive campaign uh, has been somewhat successful, both in terms of cowing uh, domestic opponents and in silencing or, or making more circumspect their international critics. Um, when President uh, Obama visits uh, Kenya, um, obviously he, he, he's going to be aware of these recent sensitivities. That doesn't mean that he has to bow to them, but an awareness of these sensitivities is important as you go about resetting the bilateral relationship. And I, I would just point to, I think, three important themes that need to be looked at in, in the context of any resetting of U.S.-Kenyan relations. And the first of these is pretty obvious, which is to celebrate the big economic and development success story in Kenya today. The Entrepreneurship Summit in, in Nairobi will, of course, be a centerpiece for that. If anyone is interested in gaining a sense of the mood of confidence and optimism in Kenya today, economically, I, I highly suggest you go back and read President Kenyatta's State of the Union message from last March, which is a real tour de force, political barnstorming, um, and, and, and in many respects actually accurately reflecting the big strides that Kenya has made over the past decade, things such as a, a rebasing of the economy and sustained 6% growth rates that have actually lifted Kenya into the rank of lower middle income countries, um, major new resource discoveries, big infrastructure projects underway around Kenya road and rail networks, uh, large increases in energy production, uh, continuing increases in, in, in broadband connectivity, um, rising, a, a more visible uh, and uh, middle class in Kenya today, um, and investors and creditors banging on the door uh, looking for uh, opportunities to, to get involved in, in Kenya's growth story. Um, you can sense the confidence in Nairobi, almost a sense of swagger and bravado on the part of Kenyan elites, uh, a sense that maybe Kenya, for the first time since independence, really does have its own, its destiny in its own hands, does have options as a nation that it did not have before, and does have options in terms of who it chooses to partner with internationally. Uh, and that will be, I think, the a, 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 what President Obama encounters in Nairobi, uh, and it makes great sense to celebrate the success story and to uh, look for ways uh, to um, to reinforce it and, and to connect with Kenya's success story. Now, just a, a couple of quick caveats. It's far from clear that this boom is completely sustainable. Um, some of these resource discoveries are going to be pretty slow coming online if they are ever realized, in particular a big project to run a, a rail and pipeline or a road and pipeline from the Lamu, a big Lamu port into southern Sudan is just going nowhere now, not likely to go anywhere as long as conditions in southern Sudan is the way it is or the way the global oil prices are. Uh, the real estate boom in Nairobi beginning to look like a bubble. Uh, and, and there's an inequality issue here as well. Uh, not everybody is getting rich as quickly as the Nairobi elites are. And that, at some point down the line, could pose a serious perception problem for the government. If there is a perception that this boom is disproportionately favoring one community or another, uh, 
that could be a formula for serious political language. Um, second uh, theme, I think, important, uh, and another obvious one are Kenya's uh, security challenges that Kenya uh, is, is facing. And this is a high priority both for Kenya and for the United States. Uh, the reality is is extremely serious and it's one that the Kenyan government is not currently in a position to adequately deal with. I think the Kenyans will expect, hope for sympathy and support from President Obama. They may also hope for increased intelligence sharing, more equipment, more training, and all of that will be fairly easy for us to supply and I suspect we will be tempted to do so and to respond positively. Uh, we, it's very much in our interest that we help Kenya begin to get control of this security situation, but I'm not sure that that particular shopping list or the provision of those kind, that kind of aid is the necessarily the best way to go about it. Kenya's security problems are not that it lacks allies or that it lacks training or that it lacks equipment. Kenya's security problems have to do with pervasive corruption in the security sector with spotty leadership, lack of coordination between security agencies, and the wrong doctrines in terms of the counterinsurgency that they need to conduct against al-Shabaab. In some ways, Kenya's situation is not that different than Nigeria's vis-a-vis Boko Haram. What Kenya needs above all else is thoroughgoing security sector reform. And hopefully there may be a way that President Obama can connect our security governance initiative to this imperial security sector reform in order to push Kenya in the right direction and enable the assistance we give them to be more effectively used. If we don't do that, I fear that we will simply be adding, doing what is easiest for us to do, but not what addresses Kenya's fundamental security problems, in fact, which may exacerbate their problems. Finally, Third, third theme I want to stress is that the president is going to have to address human rights and governance issues in Kenya and in Ethiopia as well. This doesn't have to be done in an in-your-face manner, um, but it can't be sidestepped, which I think his Kenyan hosts would prefer be the case. Uh, one big set of problems has to do with the reaction to the al-Shabaab menace in Kenya. Uh, and this reaction has included extrajudicial killings, collective punishment of entire communities, roundups and shakedowns of thousands of ordinary citizens, most of them of Somali origin, restrictions on media coverage of terrorist events, and wide-ranging crackdowns on NGOs that are vaguely suspected of, of, of contributing to radicalization or somehow delegitimizing the state. I don't have any doubt that some of those who have disappeared probably were al-Shabaab sympathizers and, and, and recruiters, and some of the NGOs that may have been delisted or targeted perhaps were providing some form of assistance to the insurgency in Kenya. But this broad-ranging crackdown has done very little to actually slow al-Shabaab's progress in Kenya. And what has it done instead is to widen the gulf between the security forces and the communities that they need to be protecting and cooperating with. And it has probably also contributed to a recruitment of frustrated and angry young Kenyans into al-Shabaab's ranks. So it would be well for us, I think, to emphasize, the president to emphasize, that in this respect at least, Kenya's counterterrorism campaign isn't working. Um, these crackdowns, by the way, proceed from and in some ways seem similar to the crackdowns I mentioned earlier following the 2013 elections. And that has led, I think, some in Kenya to worry that the terrorism problem in Kenya may be used as a pretext for a restriction of political liberties in ways that benefit the partisan political agenda of the government. Finally, um, I just want to say I mentioned earlier the, the legacy uh, of the 1990s of, of the U.S. supporting rule of law, democratization, advancement of human rights in Kenya. Um, we were on the right side of that debate back then. Um, we were, uh, I think, admired by many Kenyans, perhaps not by Daniel Arap Moy, but by many Kenyans 
for the stand that we took. One lesson I think we can derive from that is that we usually end up on the right side of history when we stick by our principles. Certainly that's the case in Kenya. Um, the trick for President Obama, and maybe the hardest part of this visit, um, is going to be to calibrate his diplomacy in this area and to do so quietly and effectively, but in a way that makes it very clear what our concerns are, uh, but not done in a way that overshadows uh, the, rest, the rest of his visit. I think I'll stop there, Great. Jennifer, with those few, few points. No, thank you, Mark. Terrence. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be back at CSIS. I think the first publication I ever had on U.S. Ethiopia was with the CSIS Africa Notes with Helen Kitchen. And so this reminds me of the long tradition CSIS has had in promoting policy-oriented discussions on uh, relations with Africa. So I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to speak on uh, Ethiopia. Uh, let me begin by saying that in addition to the challenges of uh, Ethiopia, uh, the president will be speaking at the Africa Union, and that is in fact a, uh, one of the main reasons, I think, for going to Ethiopia. There's, a, there's an interest in increasing African governance, increasing Africa's uh, commitment to uh, regional security. The Africa Union is a very weak organization, but yet has taken on some of the most difficult challenges. And while you know, imperfect, it is the show. And so uh, I think that that is a worthy uh, objective of a presidential trip. And clearly, if he's in Addis Ababa, he's going to have bilateral meetings uh, with the government there. And that is a much more difficult, in my mind at least, balancing act. Not unsimilar, or at least some of the echoes of the challenges in Kenya also apply uh, to Ethiopia. But let me, uh, let me, uh, uh, let me get, uh, get to my main points. I'm going to make a couple of points of the context for US policy, and then a few more uh, particular point. So this is really the first couple of points are just for me to me to articulate what I think U.S. policy towards Ethiopia uh, has been of late. If you listen to uh, policymakers, they often talk about policy towards Ethiopia as a three-pronged policy or a three-legged stool that consists of support for economic growth and poverty alleviation, support for uh, security, the, the security relationship that the U.S. has with Ethiopia, and then a assertion that the third leg of this stool is support for democracy, human rights, and media freedom. And I'll get to that, of course. Uh, in a minute. And these three prongs are, of course, in tension. In some ways, that's not uh, surprising. Uh, not all good things go together, and so it's a mixed message. It's a complicated message. I heard a senior U.S. official uh, uh, when I was talking about the authoritarian nature of the EPRDF responded, yes, but it's a friendly authoritarian state. And that, 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 that kind of phrase uh, gets to this kind of tension, that there are things to say about Ethiopia that you would say about a friend. And simultaneously, there are things to say about Ethiopia that you would say about an authoritarian state. And these things are not you know, they, they're in tension, but they can, they can coexist together. Let me go through the first a couple of legs, two legs, and then rather a little more on the democracy and human rights and uh, allow my uh, colleagues here and those of you in the room who know uh, so much uh, to speak. That there, uh, I think there has been genuine change at a grassroots level with regard to poverty in Ethiopia. I, I, would, I would urge uh, the president or anybody thinking about Ethiopia to look at the kind of village level health clinic, regional university kinds of contributions that have been made, and less so on the kind of high modernism of huge dams and trains and so on. I think the real difference is coming at a real micro level, uh, and there's a long way to go. Uh, it's a very early days of a huge developmental challenge, but there are some things there that deserve uh, support and deserve of a recognition. There's some challenges uh, on the economic side. Uh, uh, in particular, I think there's some challenges on the questions of I'll call land leases. A lot of other people would call, call them land grabs, but that land is being uh, leased to uh, multinational uh, corporations in a way that the most marginalized populations typically do not benefit in, in uh, justly in the rewards uh, of, of those projects. 
On the security front, uh, there's two prongs of that as well. There's a counterterrorism piece, and then there's a peacekeeping piece. Uh, the U.S. does have counterterrorism interests in the Horn of Africa. Uh, Ethiopia has interests in counterterrorism in the Horn of Africa. I'm not at all certain they're always the same interests. They both have concerns, often concerns about the same groups, but for very different reasons and with very different histories and with very different desired endpoints. And I, uh, I, I think it, the U.S. ought to be clear on where Ethiopia is doing things in its own interest and we, are, we see that as advancing our interests and when Ethiopia is doing things in its interests that are not uh, serving our interests and, and, and so on. This particularly relates to Eritrea uh, and Somalia. Uh, Say another word about that, but in one of my concluding points to ask the question on counterterrorism policy, are these policies creating more or less instability in, uh, in the long term? Are they serving U.S. interests or not uh, in the long term? The other part of that uh, security uh, relationship, though, that I would, uh, I think is has to be uh, included is the question on peacekeeping uh, and Ethiopia's support for multilateral uh, peacekeeping operations. The U.S. has been very, very happy with that Ethiopia has provided troops on some of the difficult peacekeeping operations in Sudan and Darfur and South Sudan, uh, Abyei, uh, and that in many ways from a, uh, those troops are not easily replaced. I won't say they're irreplaceable, but it would be very difficult to get uh, uh, troops uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a state of readiness and with the capabilities that Ethiopian uh, troops have. All right. Uh, if that was all there was to the story, in some ways it would be a much easier trip. But Ethiopia, this third leg of the stool, uh, relates to questions of democracy, uh, human rights, and media freedom. I can speak at length about uh, you know, why, uh, uh, what, a, what a strong authoritarian uh, ruling party, the EPRDF, the ruling party, Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, is. The fact that they won 100% of the seats in the May elections, you know, that's not, you know, how, how much more than 100% do you need to know? It, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty clear indication of just how powerful uh, they are. Uh, they're also, uh, until recently, the largest, Africa's largest jailer of journalists. And there's really been a process ever since the 2005 elections, uh, competitive elections, that I think frightened or at least uh, alarmed uh, the EPRDF. There's been an ongoing process of criminalizing dissent, that if you are, are trying to articulate an alternative to the party, that is being treated as, as treason, that's being treated as in league with terrorists, that's being treated as illegitimate, anti-constitutional, anti-people, uh, as they sometimes use the language in Ethiopia. And that is part of this very, very strong uh, authoritarian system. And in that way, U.S. relations with Ethiopia, rather than Kenya perhaps, more resemble uh, relations with other strategically, geostrategically important states that have troublesome records on democracy and human rights from the U.S. point of view. Countries like Egypt, countries like Pakistan, countries where two things are going it, that are in, in tension uh, with each other, and therefore the United States often struggles to come up with the message when in fact there's two different things that they want to articulate. Uh, and so that will be uh, Obama's, President Obama's uh, challenge to say simultaneously, we're very happy with some of the development advances. We really appreciate your support for peacekeeping in Abyei and in South Sudan negotiations, but we have deep, deep concerns about the, the uh, almost complete elimination of political space, the arrests of journalists, the harassment of opposition parties, uh, and the, uh, the restrictions on civil society. Maybe just make sure, since uh, I, I don't leave this off the record, that people think I'm not, not making the point, that Ethiopia has put in laws that, in, that that really restrict, have the intention and have had the effect of basically eliminating the ability of Ethiopian civil society organizations to work on democratization, human rights, even things like women's rights, children's rights, the rights of disabled peoples. Uh, and that is extremely uh, problematic in a state as large and as complicated as Ethiopia. And it's also used the counterterrorism law to really restrict uh, media. I'd be happy to speak more, and my colleagues may have the, may uh, want to fill in some of those details. Now, the two 
those are, that's the kind of context of the uh, policy. The two, uh, although I almost always will come up with three, but the two main points that I want to give that are a little bit more uh, trying to, to synthesize is the one is on the question of U.S. leverage over Ethiopia, and then the second is about short-term versus long-term uh, security. Uh, U.S. government officials often will say that they have very limited leverage over Ethiopia. After all, a lot of our aid budget is tied to things like HIV AIDS or humanitarian assistance, and so uh, we can't really threaten to cut off that money in order to uh, to to, uh, to to accomplish uh, to 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 apply pressure on a government as fiercely uh, uh, proud and resistant of uh, international pressure as the Ethiopian uh, government has been, and there's something to that. But I think the, the the point that comes up in the context of this trip is that this trip is leverage. This trip is something the Ethiopians really really want. And while the U.S. might want to say, no, it's not a seal of approval, it's part of a discussions with a, with, a, with a state like we have discussions with all kinds of state, you know, look at the Ethiopian government's webpage <laughs> during the time of the trip. Look at what was going to lead the local news. Look what the embassy is going to say. This is a big, big deal to Ethiopia. And therefore, to me, the question is, how has that leverage been used in ways that can advance U.S. interests on democracy and human rights? And I think at least to date, the answer uh, there ha hasn't been much to show for it. There have been some journalists who've been released, and I'm very, very happy to see that. One might well say in the same breath, if I can not breathe long enough, uh, but that these, these journalists probably, you know, these journalists never should have been arrested, so freeing these journalists doesn't get you a gold star. It just means that you have now uh, taken uh, that step. I understand these journalists, by the way, have not been given back their passports, so even as they've been released, it's a kind of a, uh, a restricted ability to play their important role as independent uh, uh, journalists. What I would think is the much more kind of structural changes that ought to be on the agenda, where this leverage of this trip ought to be used, is one, while the journalists are important, they are important in, and they're important as individual stories, uh, as people who some of us know, but that the real structural power issue, what's much more important, is the conviction of the Ethiopian Muslim leadership that took place earlier this month. That is a big, big deal. That is an important movement. That is where the Ethiopian government is in real tension with a significant portion of its community, and it really, I think, uh, tells uh, yet another story about how authoritarianism uh, works in Ethiopia. I also think that, to get back to the laws that I mentioned, what would really matter where you'd see real evidence of the use of this leverage is on things like uh, the, the CSO law, this regulation of NGOs. If, if that was changed, if that was, uh, uh, was removed, I'd say, okay, the Ethi U.S. is really getting something for its leverage. Or if the anti-terrorism law uh, was, or counter-terrorism law, was, was changed in a way that it wasn't applied so broadly that it's very difficult for independent journalists uh, to do their work. And so I would be very happy and we'll look to see if the uh, U.S. government, if, the, if, if President Obama is able to raise these issues that I think are much more than the symbolic issues but really get at the heart of why there is such limited political space in Ethiopia. The second and final, until I think of a third uh, issue, has to do with uh, th this question, are we building our relationships in the Horn of Africa around an assumption regarding Ethiopia's likely stability and Ethiopia's role as a stabilizing force in the region that needs to be questioned? In other words, if, we, if the answer to, well, we have to have the strong, friendly relationship with Ethiopia because it is essential for stability in the region, is that necessarily true? Is it true in the long term? What happens to this regime 5, 10, 15 years out? And what might the US be doing now to prepare for that? How is Ethiopia, in fact, playing roles that may destabilize in Somalia, in Eritrea, and potentially elsewhere in the region. I was very taken with Ambassador Bellamy's reminder of the U.S. legacy of working on pro-democracy uh, NGO development in Kenya at a time when it wasn't welcomed, when it was controversial, where the government didn't thank us for that, but yet the payoffs that you see down the road. And I don't think that kind of logic or that type of, uh, uh, that type of uh, 
concern for working with long-term, building long-term relationships with the key uh, political leaders of the future uh, has been uh, made. Uh, let me also on this question of, of relationships maybe just end with one, uh, one, one final point to make sure that some of you, I know a journalist who will be going on this trip or who follow uh, uh, relationships. The Ethiopian government has made some, some really quite astonishing bellicose statements about Eritrea recently that really are, are, really are, are laying the groundwork for what could be an escalation of that, con of that conflict, the Ethiopia-Eritrea conflict. And that it would be very useful for the United States and for President Obama to say directly to the highest level of issues, officials, we are not on board with you on that. That uh, uh, crossing the border into Eritrea would be a catastrophe and you shouldn't do it. To make sure that there's no, was it a yellow light or a green light or a red light, but no ambiguity on that, on that point. Uh, let me, let me leave it there because I know we have so many uh, questions and wisdom in the room and on my other panelists and thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to speak about four things today. Um, first, dive into a little bit more detail about uh, the point that Ambassador Bellamy made around civil society uh, in Kenya and what has been happening lately and how hopefully the president's trip will uh, catalyze some change. Second, uh, to dive in again a little deeper on the U.S.-Kenya security relationship. Third, to talk briefly about uh, corruption in Kenya and how this U.S. trip um, may be able to uh, spur some movement on that. And lastly, a bit about the refugee situation. As Jennifer mentioned, um, the Open Society Foundations has an East Africa foundation. It is based in Nairobi. Um, we focus primarily on human rights and governance grants to civil society organizations. Um, we do not make grants in Ethiopia um, for very... <laughs> legitimate and obvious reasons. Um, we are an international grant-making organization. Two of our grantees in Kenya um, have been the subject of intimidation, harassment, and um, potentially uh, life-changing uh, conduct from the government of Kenya. And those two organizations are called Muslims for Human Rights, or Muhuri, and Haki Africa. These two organizations are based in Mombasa, and they are at the heart of the fight between the communities that are the victims of terrorism and also the victims of counterterrorism operations by the government of Kenya and the government of Kenya itself. They play an absolutely essential role in building a bridge between the government and these communities. And yet, due in large part to their criticism of the government of Kenya for these counterterrorism um, tactics that, as Ambassador Bellamy um, mentioned, have resulted in gross human rights violations, um, found themselves under fire. And in August, they were placed on a um, list of entities suspected to be associated with al-Shabaab, and their bank accounts were frozen. Um, despite complying with every single request from the government of Kenya and the NGO Coordination Board, to this day, their, their bank accounts remain frozen. There was a glimmer of hope when the high court um, ruled recently that they, sh they do not belong on this list um, of uh, being suspected of, of associating with al-Shabaab. Um, but again, you know, they're in limbo. Hopefully, the president ahead of his trip can move the government of Kenya on their status. Um, very concretely, we would hope that any meeting with civil society that the president has includes these two groups. It would send a very clear signal of support for not only these groups, their work, the, Muslims commun the Muslim community that is finding itself increasingly discriminated against, harassed, and victimized. And it also would support the president's purported policy of standing by civil society. As you know, for the last several years, this has been um, repeatedly emphasized by the president in, in numerous speeches and, and policy and programming that you know, the U.S. is going to stand by civil society. When he was in Panama earlier this year, he said civil society is the conscience of our countries. And that's a powerful statement. So let's turn that rhetoric into a reality. And although it is no doubt diplomatically uncomfortable when, um, when pressing this point, we nevertheless hope that the president makes this uh, one of the focal points uh, leading up to the trip. 
One of the uh, guises that the government of Kenya uses when going after groups like Haki Africa and Muhuri or generally cracking down on civil society, I should note that it's not just about these two groups. These are but an example of really a, a wider environment of a shrinking civic space. Um, there are, are two arguments you hear. One, that NGOs are not regulated enough in Kenya, and two, that we need to go after those groups because we suspect links to terrorist financing. So I think it's important to, to break that down. First of all, there is regulation in Kenya uh, of, of NGOs. And by the way, there's no problem per se with regulating NGOs. I work for an NGO. We have to file tax forms. You know, it, it's, it is an appropriate exercise of government of, of authority, only when it's done so not for political purposes, right? So that's, that's the problem that we keep confronting. There's a public benefits organization law that was passed in 2013. There's been murmurs of amending it, changing it. There was an attempt uh, last year that was quickly rebuffed um, by international outcry and local pressure. Um, and if it really is about ter terrorist financing, then let's strengthen the anti-money laundering laws that are in Kenya. And let's support the government of Kenya in, in going after that specific point. That's something that the US has a tremendous amount of experience in. Um, and lastly, I, I hope when the president is in, uh, is in Kenya, he does talk about the, not just the freedom of, of human rights defenders to operate, but also their personal security. This is something that's incredibly worrisome for us. Um, the, it's not just about their ability to operate, it's also about their livelihoods, their lives. I, I know he's not in the room, but I do want to thank Ambassador Bob Godak, um, our US ambassador in Nairobi, who has been an incredibly staunch supporter of Kenyan civil society and of these two groups. It has meant a tremendous uh, amount to them. And you know, if we can elevate it up to the president, that would be all the better. So this links directly with the US security relationship with Kenya. Because again, you know, these two groups are doing the exact kind of work that we need if we're going to win the war against al-Shabaab. Right? We need those in the communities who are at the forefront of countering violent extremism, of countering radical, countering radical ideology, to be on our side. So rather than shun them, we need to bring them more into the fold. And obviously, the, the President of the United States recognizes this, uh, as evidenced by earlier this year, the Countering Violent Extremism Summit, where this kind of um, message was hammered home again and again. And in fact, Hussein Khalid, who is the executive director of Hockey Africa, was invited to that summit. Again, there is a real security threat. I'm not going to argue that there isn't. But we need to be strategic. We need to think about how we're actually going to win. And the government of Kenya can't do it alone. And the tactics used by the security forces are counterproductive. Uh, several years ago, the Open Society Justice Initiative put out a report on the anti-terror police unit which it operates uh, throughout Kenya, but this report was specifically on their operations in Mombasa and detailed a number of extrajudicial killings, forced uh, disappearances, and other human rights abuses. And one of, the, one of the main points of the report is that part of the problem is that there is not adequate judicial remedy either for the security force abuses themselves or for the potential terrorists. The, the, the title of the report was, We're Tired of Taking You to Court. And that was something that the AT, one of the ATPU officers that we interviewed said, that time and time again, they had take, taken a suspected terrorist to court, never got the resolution that they wanted, so he ended up dead. Obviously, that is not going to be a sustainable solution. There needs to be a judicial mechanism for holding potential terrorists accountable, but also for holding those who perpetrate those uh, human rights abuses in the security forces accountable. Despite all of the extrajudicial killings and forced disappearances that we've documented, there has never been an arrest of a security force officer for those abuses. That's unacceptable. There was a regional countering violent extremism summit in Kenya recently, and unfortunately, neither Haki Africa nor Muhuri were invited. Um, and that is a real disappointment. 
and I think speaks volumes to the way that the government of Kenya currently views this problem. Again, going back to the CVE summit that was held uh, in, in Washington earlier this year where you know, the president and the administration were talking about inclusion, talking about bringing in marginalized communities into this debate, talking about social and economic and political drivers, the government of Kenya was not speaking from that song sheet. And they do not meet with the community the way that we would hope that they would. And I hope that when the president is there later this month that he talks about the fact that with some humility, we have been through this before. We have learned lessons. You have to work with the community from the outset. Encourage them to go down to, I think signs of this are happening, by the way, that I have heard from our colleagues in Mombasa that government officials are starting to come down and have these conversations. So if that's happening, that's tremendous. That's a sign of progress to keep it going. And also to stress justice for these security uh, abuses. On corruption, all of us were watching with maybe some perplexed looks on our faces as the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission presented what they called their list of shame for the Anglo leasing scandal. Um, but then <laughs> continued to watch as those commissioners were forced to resign due to pressure from the government of Kenya and that there has been a motion to have the Anti-Corruption Commission disbanded. I think we can all agree that corruption is a major issue in Kenya and one that needs to be tackled head on. That said, that's a Kenyan issue that needs to be resolved in Kenya. That's not something that the U.S. is going to be able to do. The political will has to come from Kenya. The prosecutions are appropriately done inside of Kenya. But I still think that there is something that in the U.S. we can do, which is to look whether these the proceeds of any of that corruption land in U.S. soil, and if so, what, a, what complicity of U.S. institutions is there, and how can we rectify that? Um, I do hope that the President talks about corruption and its direct impact on security, terrorism, democracy, and human rights, and, and tries to build up some of that political will, but again, I think that is going to have to come from that side. Lastly, on refugees. Um, we were very heartened to hear Secretary Kerry announce $45 million in new funding for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, you know, there's over 600,000 refugees in Kenya. Um, we were also glad to see the court in Kenya strike down the provision of the security law that was passed with haste in December um, that would have put a cap on the number of refugees in Kenya. Um, that obviously would have been a disaster. It's Important to note that there are people in, in Dadaab um, that were born and raised there and, and are adults. So sending them back to Somalia with no network of support with a place that they do not know would not only be a violation of international humanitarian law and the principle of refoulement, it also just doesn't make any sense. We have a, a fellow named Ben Rollins who spent two years in and out of Dadaab and one of the... Um, the aims of his work is to counter this prevailing assumption that Dadaab is a hotbed of extremism or a nursery for terrorists. He sees it rather as potentially an engine for middle income growth and moderation, that we need to change the way that we see Dadaab and not fall into the rhetoric that we hear from so many Kenyan politicians and to a certain extent from the US government itself. Um, by the way, Ben has a book coming out in January called City of Thorns, so stay tuned uh, if I can put in a plug. Um, first step is to start sending some U.S. government officials to Dadaab. They don't really travel there. Um, that, if we're going to counter that um, current framing uh, of what the refugee camp is, it needs to start there. So last thing, I think this goes to what Terrence was saying about the journalists who have been released and potentially um, getting some action ahead of the president's trip. I'm nervous about what's going to happen after the president leaves, that we might get a little action. We might get some folks um, out of jail. We might get the bank accounts on frozen. And then as soon as the spotlight is off, then they try to pass even more repressive legislation or these guys are rearrested. So to whatever extent possible that we can forecast um, some way of 
ensuring that attention does not completely die down after the president's visit, and that, yes, we're getting as much as we can using this as leverage, but that we're also ensuring that it's not a temporary measure. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Sarah. E.J., final word. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's always hard to uh, be last uh, on a panel like this, um, both in, in terms of trying to uh, keep up with everyone else, but, but also to, uh, to try to talk about different issues uh, that have already been raised. So what I was planning on doing was actually kind of expanding the, 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 the lens a little bit uh, in terms of what I think the U.S. security concerns probably will be uh, on this trip and, and arguably should be, uh, certainly from our view. And, and that's largely because the U.S. security concerns aren't focused just solely on Kenya and Ethiopia, but, but as well on South Sudan and Somalia and arguably Sudan as well. Uh, and as everyone knows, uh, there are uh, wars raging in, uh, in Somalia and South Sudan in particular, but, but also in Sudan uh, that remain uh, perennial problems and headaches for the administration and um, countries where there obviously are significant regional stakes uh, that complicate peacemaking efforts. I should note, just to make sure we're on the same page, that you know both Ethiopia and Kenya are important security partners for the United States in, in, in these wars. Ethiopia has troops in the AU force in Somalia, it's called AMISOM, and two um, UN forces in Sudan, UNISFA, which is based in the enclave of Abyei, and UNAMID in Darfur. Kenya also has a very large contingent in AMISOM and smaller contingents in UNAMID and the UN peacekeeping operation in South Sudan, UNMIS. And this, or these operations, I should say, are costing the US and Western partners hundreds of millions of dollars a year uh, in, 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 in direct support and also in indirect support that they provide uh, through uh, bilateral training assistance and, and other activities. Now clearly, um, you know, these wars are of major concern, uh, both to Ethiopia and Kenya. Uh, Somalia and South Sudan border both states and therefore represents huge security threats and also, I should add, have significant economic repercussions on, on these countries. Uh, particularly for Kenya, uh, Kenya was very heavily invested in South Sudan uh, before the conflict. Um, uh, Kenya, as, um, as Ambassador Mel Bellamy uh, mentioned, really had staked a lot of um, attention and hope on building uh, this so-called Lapsit Corridor, which would have built a huge megaport in Lamu, and then created this huge new um, both uh, transport uh, and, uh, and infrastructure uh, network that would have expanded throughout East Africa and could have been a model of, or could have been an engine of development for many parts of East Africa, and unfortunately, of course, that's on hold uh, because of the war. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that Addis Ababa is very concerned about the spillover of the conflict in Somalia into its largely Somali-inhabited Ogaden region, uh, formerly known as Region 5, and likewise concerned about spillover of the war in South Sudan into the Nuer and Anuak inhabited Gambela region of, of its country in uh, the southwest. Nairobi is a little bit less concerned about South, South Sudan so far, I should add, but has, as I mentioned before, suffered significant economic losses, but it has a much greater direct security um, concern uh, with the war in Somalia, which has now become a significant security threat to parts of its country and arguably to um, its project of devolution uh, and the establishment of a durable state after the implementation of the 2010 uh, Constitution. And you are all obviously or hopefully aware of the spectacular attacks that have occurred in, in, in Kenya over the last couple of years on Westgate Mall and lastly or lately on Garissa University uh, that have not just exacted a huge humanitarian toll, but is increasingly creating divisions between uh, the Muslim minority and the Christian minority uh, in the country. And I should add that this, of course, was one of the goals of those attacks. Now, I should add that Kenya intervened in Somalia despite the urging of the US government and other allies uh, to get involved because they wanted to create a buffer zone 
actually in, in, in an effort to try to promote this LAPSET project that I, I mentioned. But unfortunately, it has backfired. And rather than uh, trying to contain the problem of Al-Shabaab in Somalia, it is now largely uh, driven, or at least parts of Al-Shabaab, into uh, Kenyan's own territory. As far as we can tell, there now appear to be three autonomous Al-Shabaab units actively operating in northeast Kenya and on the coast. They seem to be operating in small, closely knit, and secretly, but highly mobile cells that have been able to uh, attack Kenyan targets repeatedly. And in fact, although it's not reported um, in Western media, they will come in, take over entire villages, hold them for hours, sometimes even days, before they are forced out. So this is becoming a very significant threat for the Kenyan um, uh, security services. And at this moment, they are largely reacting rather than anticipating uh, these attacks uh, by al-Shabaab. And al-Shabaab has very, very effectively portrayed their operations through a, re uh, through a religious lens that is resonating uh, with, uh, again, the Muslim minority, not just in, in Kenya, but also in Somalia. We can get into that in detail later, but arguably also in other Muslim territories uh, in East Africa. Uh, and I should mention, uh, just to follow up on what Terence was saying, even though no one really knows what the numbers are, it's probably close to, or I should say the Muslim population of Ethiopia is probably close to 40%. So this is not a small number of people in, in Ethiopia. It's a very large minority population. And they are largely excluded from most national political uh, discourse. Now, what is al-Shabaab trying to do in Kenya? Al-Shabaab in Kenya, or al-Shabaab is trying to force Kenya to pull its forces out of uh, Somalia. It's also trying to force the national government to retreat in large part from the Northeast and the coastal ter territories. And ultimately, it is starting to espouse similar goals as ISIS in Syria and, and, and Iraq and uh, Boko Haram in, um, in the Lake Chad Basin in that it wants to ultimately carve out an Islamic emirate linked to Muslim majority territories in the rest of the East Coast of Africa and the Horn. But like, um, in Somalia, al-Shabaab is not just focusing on religious grievances, it's also using local conflicts and grievances to extend its reach and its aims. And what it's doing, it's, it's using frictions between local communities that have to some degree been exacerbated by the Kenyan um, project to devolve power uh, in an effort to uh, expand its operations. And it's, it's, it's a kind of interesting tension that everyone sees even here in the United States, right, where there's this tension between the national government and the local government. And to some degree, when the local government becomes uh, empowered, that creates even, even more tensions within local communities as they struggle over who has control over those, uh, over those areas or over those authorities. And that is really, really driving uh, a lot of tensions in, um, in Kenya at the moment. It's also interestingly exploiting uh, deep-seated grievances uh, in Kenya over land rights, over who has control over different territories, uh, particularly on the coast, uh, but in other parts of Kenya as well. But I should also add that this is becoming not just a regional issue. It is, it is starting to internationalize in a sense that al-Shabaab is also, as far as we understand, starting to reach out to other elements of ISIS or other uh, radical groups, particularly in Yemen, um, that are uh, loosely aligned with ISIS. And this, of course, has uh, repercussions beyond uh, just the Horn of Africa, um, but uh, can uh, exacerbate tensions uh, through the much larger region. Now, unfortunately, what does that mean in terms of uh, trends and trajectories for Kenya? Uh, it certainly looks, as far as we can tell, unless things change dramatically, that al-Shabaab will likely maintain, perhaps even increase the tempo of its attacks in the northeast and on the coast, uh, with obviously very uh, significant consequences. 
And unfortunately, unless uh, Kenya really reforms uh, the way it operates, uh, it reforms how the security structure, how the security services are structured and coordinate uh, the heavy-handed counterterrorism tactics that it has utilized in the past, will only increase the inflamed passions and tensions in the Northeast and on the coast, and drive more and more people into the hands of Al Shabaab. Interestingly, or I should say, uh, unfortunately, what these attacks are also doing is it's driving Kenyan civil servants to flee um, from the Northeast and from some parts of the coast. And what that invariably means that the services or the limited services that those local populations were getting from the government are now actually declining. So you don't, even, you don't only have the grievances that are being exacerbated by heavy-handed security tactics, you also have the grievances that are being exacerbated by perceptions that they are not, or that local populations are not getting the same um, amount of services that people up coast are having. And of course, that also feeds into um, these tensions. Um, lastly, but not least, what would that also mean for the humanitarian situation? Oh, two minutes. All right. Um, uh, well, just briefly, I think we really, really need to be concerned about a humanitarian crisis in, Ken in, in the northeast of Kenya. Uh, that's, that's going to affect not just the refugee population that uh, Sarah has spoken about, but just local people as well. And it's be very difficult to access these populations uh, given the security services. Uh, now, ooh, how to, well, well, I guess just briefly to, to, to go ahead because at times, clearly what's going to happen is in addition to the messages that President Obama will have to send to the national governments in terms of what they need to do to fix their own problems or their own domestic challenges, is that they will have to resolve the conflicts in South Sudan and Somalia as well, for there to be a durable solution um, to, and, and I should say durable development in the region. And that really um, leads us to, to, to recommend two recommendations to President Obama. The first is that as he speaks to his uh, Kenyan and Ethiopian interlocutors, there needs to be a recognition that in Somalia, more effort needs to be placed on the politics of, of, of rebuilding the state, particularly the bottom-up approach of building the local state-level institutions rather than focusing on the Somali federal government in Mogadishu. Just supporting AMISOM is not going to defeat Al-Shabaab. Unless you have credible and inclusive institutions in Somalia, the Al-Shabaab problem or radicalization in, more, in, in general are not going to be addressed. Uh, and we think that that's something that needs to be emphasized vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, uh, Kenya and, and Somalia. The same thing to some degree needs to be uh, said about uh, the situation of the civil war in South Sudan. The problem that we really have in South Sudan right now is that uh, we have two warring parties who are relatively weak vis-a-vis -vis their neighboring states, but they have been able to utilize divisions among the neighboring states as to what they would like to achieve in South Sudan to continue the war and uh, to not accept uh, these peace proposals that have been uh, put on the table uh, for quite some time. And the thing that we would ask uh, President Obama to stress again with uh, President uh, Kenyatta and Prime Minister Desalegan is that EGAD states need to resolve their own differences on what they would like to achieve in South Sudan. And once they have done so, to pressure the parties that are fighting to accept a deal that is acceptable or, well, that's, that's not acceptable to any of them, but to pressure the parties to accept the deal that's on the table uh, in an effort to move forward and hopefully at least create some kind of a stable transitional government that then can deal with the much larger uh, and deeper issues uh, that have uh, uh, restarted the war there. Thank you. Thanks, EJ, and sorry, the, the last guy who goes kind of <laughs> gets the ax. Um, yes, let's take, a, let's take four questions at a time and come back to the panel. Um, we'll go here, uh, the gentleman there, me, and um, the lady, uh, yeah. So start here, up front. Uh, 
Um, thank you very much all for very wonderful presentations. My name is Jerome, I'm with UNAIDS, and um, the United States, as you may all know, is one of the biggest donors to HIV and AIDS. Um, and I'm wondering if any of you think that um, AIDS or HIV and AIDS or human rights in relation to HIV and AIDS will feature um, in President Obama's visit, given the renewed importance that Kenya is playing uh, as well uh, with many of the new PEPFA programs like DREAMS and, and the ACT initiative, um, focusing on Kenya as uh, one of its uh, initial countries. Thank you. Great, thank you. Gentlemen there. Thanks. Uh, George Condon, National Journal. Uh, you talked about the issues, but as the President indicated yesterday, there's an intensely personal aspect to this when you have the first African-American President visiting Africa. Uh, can you talk about that aspect? Has he met the expectations? Do they still feel a special kinship with him? How's that going? Thank you. Uh, Ni Akwete. Thank you very much, Nia Kwete, African Immigrant Caucus. Um, I was wondering if um, the panel will agree, is it just me or has Washington been walking away from its commitment to democracy across Africa? Because the president's first visit was to Ghana where he talked about, he stressed democracy. Yes, terrorism and security are important. Yes, poverty alleviation and economic development are important. But in Accra, he made it clear that democracy comes first. Since then, it seems to me that it's been receding. And so I was wondering if you think I'm wrong. Great. And the lady um, there. Thank you very much, Lily from um, uh, NED. Uh, there are different views uh, related to Obama's visit, to particularly to Ethiopia. Uh, on, on one hand, um, of course, the, all the development on the economic growth we have been talking about, the peop majority of the people have been exp exp uh, excluded. And w w while that is on the ground, uh, when people are silenced to talk about it, when me there is no media, when there is no space for association or any uh, kind of movement. Um, yes, I'm happy to hear that my friends got out last week. But on what, con on what condition did they get released? Uh, the court did not say anything. There was no reason provided. And actually, the law says if the prosecutor finds additional evidence, they can reinitiate the charge. So it shows that uh, this is just maybe to make Obama happy uh, ahead of his trip. So um, Obama will come back, but the civil society law, the anti-terrorism law will remain in Ethiopia. Uh, on the other hand, the Ethiopian government is highly advertising Obama's visit. They say his visit is because um, we have made our homework, we have uh, showed our success as a government, and he's going to congratulate them. That's what they tell people on the, uh, on the government media day and night. And there is no other alternative in Ethiopia for the people to hear the other side of the concerns we are talking about here. So there are big question marks in my mind on how Obama is going to make a point um, in opening uh, political spaces, in opening the media, in uh, amending the civil society laws and uh, the anti-terrorism laws. Because um, uh, who is Obama meeting when he goes? Only the government officials? Will he have a chance to talk to opposition parties? Will he uh, have a chance to talk to political prisoners, opposition leaders? How is he going to make a point is still a question for me. Um, thank you. I think we'll turn back to the panel. I mean, one of my hopes is that if he does a photo op with the prime minister, maybe he can do an equivalent photo op with the journalists released. Um, um, might send a nice signal, even even a, if it's a symbolic one. Um, why don't we turn to the panel? Uh, does someone want to address the HIV/AIDS? Um, I'll just say very briefly because I don't I, I, I don't know is the answer to your question, but. Um, I did think it was interesting that when I was looking into the numbers around U.S. security assistance to Kenya, it's about $42 million for 2015, and uh, humanitarian assistance, which for the most part is for global health, is $545 million, so it's 
hugely, you know, dwarfs our security assistance, and yet that's like all I'm obsessed with and think about. So I take your point that, you know, we need to be thinking about, you know, our other assistance, and, you know, we have a public health program that constantly tries to get that number even higher, but, um, but so yeah, I don't have a kind of answer. I mean, I do think it's, it's, both of these countries are huge recipients of pretty much every big U.S. assistance program in Africa, Feed the Future, Power Africa, huge investments. They're among the largest recipients on PEPFAR uh, funding and, and global health. Um, Kenya is on Trade Africa. It goes a bit to Nee's point that, you know, democracy is joined by many other programs now, so does it lose its relative weight as kind of interests diversify and programming diversifies. But you know, the US has, has invested such a great deal in HIV um, and maternal health as well that it, I, it seems that, that that would come up uh, at least in rhetoric. Yeah, I, I kind of hope it comes up. You know, I mentioned that, that for a number of years, Kenya was our largest aid recipient. 70% of that global health, as, as Sarah said, and most of that PEPFAR. Um, I, I don't remember the exact number, but I think it's something like 750,000 Kenyans are now on antiretroviral therapy thanks to the PEPFAR program. That's, a, that's actually a huge, a huge success story, and it's, and it's part of the reason that Kenya's doing well on its economic and development agenda. Unfortunately, it's not talked about enough. And one of the things that always frustrated me was that we didn't hear enough from Kenyan authorities about that, about that particular program or about its impact, its favorable impact, or about how they viewed uh, what the what the U.S. was doing in this kind of Obama going back to his father's um, homeland question. Um, you know, f first we we were talking to uh, Governor Dotto this morning, um, who said that there's huge runaway expectations in Kenya ab about this trip and huge excitement in Kenya. There was a lot of disappointment. Um, when he went to Ghana, that he did not make his first trip um, to Kenya. And I gather there's going to be an element of kind of, you know, kind of returning to his father's roots um, when he goes. It does seem, though, that Kenya in and of itself is a place that any U.S. president should visit, regardless of what their ancestry might be. I mean, it's, it's important on so many dimensions, as uh, Mark said, in terms of security, humanitarian, in terms of its position in the horn, in terms of the governance investments that we've made and the governance concerns that maybe we have today. So um, there's huge excitement in Kenya and perhaps uh, over uh, excessive expectations of what this trip might deliver. Um, but. But Kenya on its own is, is, is warrants a trip. And so I tend to look at it through that prism rather than uh, the returning, um, you know, uh, descendant. I don't know if anyone wants to remark on that, but maybe on the democracy, or EJ? Well, I guess what I would just say is I don't think that Kenyans think of Obama as African-American. They think of him as Kenyan-American, and, and <laughs> arguably they, they even think of him as Luo-American. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, as, as was said earlier, um, this, was, this was something that they thought they would get much sooner. I mean, this was obviously complicated by the ICC indictment of Kenyatta and, and some other issues as well. But, uh, yes, this is very, very... Um, well, well received in Kenya, and I was talking to my colleague yesterday. He said they're spiffing up the capital. I mean, one of the things that that they're all just happy about is that, regardless of what Obama brings, at least the roads are clean. Uh, you know, everything has been kind of nicely shined up, and and so that's one of the deliverables even before he comes. Uh, now, I, I guess just to kind of move things along. I mean, I think you know, in, in all fairness to policymakers, I think the the, the U.S. government walks a very, very fine line on, on democracy promotion. I mean, I would certainly argue that sometimes they haven't pushed hard enough. I've worried about something that I've called the peacekeeping veto, where there's been a number of countries, particularly in the Horn, that have contributed troops to very important peacekeeping operations in the United States, then using those contributions kind of effectively as a veto, uh, i.e. Rwanda has used this in the past, Museveni's used this as well, to basically say, well, if you continue to criticize us, I'll yank my boys out. Um, and I've always argued that 
well, maybe you should call their bluff because they're also getting a lot of benefits from having troops in these peacekeeping operations. They're making a lot of money. They're getting a lot of training. They're also getting rid of a lot of troops that otherwise would be sitting at home perhaps causing trouble. Um, the other thing that, that I do find very, very encouraging, at least in terms of U.S. policy, is that the U.S. Pol US government has, over the last couple of years, been fairly consistent about term limits and, and, and pushing this notion that you've been president for your constitutional limit of terms. It is now time for someone else to take over, you know, to have, have kind of a, a transfer of power. And I think that that's been a very, very welcome signal in, in, in many, well, it's been a welcome signal for many people in Africa, perhaps not for many aging despots in Africa. But, um, you know, I, I do think that there's been some measured progress with some, I think, also very real politique um, uh, steps back. The last thing just to mention on this issue is that we also have to really think about, well, what U.S. policy is being created by, right? And, and part of the problem that we have in Africa, at least in my view, is that so much of the money that is uh, allocated for Africa beyond, you know, this, this kind of fixed um, PEPFAR and feed the future money that's been allocated and essentially is kind of on autopilot is largely allocated to the Defense Department and the security services. And so what you see in Africa is a lot of the money that the United States is spending is spent on security stuff. And I think that's unfortunate. It's so unfortunate that even Robert Gates at one time said, look, we are spending too much on the military and not enough on the State Department and other softer elements of U.S. foreign policy power. Can I just add on that? Um, I was also going to raise this issue of, of third terms because that has been you know, so solidly uh, at the top of the priority list for U.S. Um, policy in Africa. It seems like the U.S. government has chosen a couple of these concrete issues that they're willing to go to bat for, and maybe to you know those of us who are on the outside, we get frustrated when they're not you know covering all the things we want them to. But beyond the the term limit issue, I think also LGBT rights. If you look at what you know the U.S. has done on LGBT rights in Africa, it's been unequivocal, right? And um, you know sometimes to the point where it backfires, but nevertheless, it has been a, a stated policy. I think the the frustration comes in the unequal application of these uh, this treatment, right? I know there are lots of folks within Zimbabwe who wonder why they get treated a certain way when the folks in Ethiopia get treated completely differently when really, if you look at it empirically, almost the same set of issues exist. Um, so I think that's that's something that the U.S. government could work on is the, the more uniform application, but that gets into all of these other, as EJ mentioned, real politique issues. Um, but it's funny that you brought up Rwanda, because I was actually going to use that as an example of where I think finally the U.S. government did change a long-standing entrenched um, set of blinders that it had for, for Rwanda when finally it was faced with the, the M23 crisis in Eastern Congo, and it did take certain steps to sanction Rwanda. I mean, granted, I think the pendulum has probably swung back, but regardless, I think there we can pick and choose a couple of instances where they have gone to bat. I think one, one response to uh, Lily's point uh, about uh, on Ethiopia, uh, and I'm just going to use it as a way to tie back to something that uh, I guess it was Sarah said, is that and it, it, is, it is very important to watch what happens after the trip and to make sure that any of the symbolic openings or release of prisoners or loosening of re uh, regulations, unfreezing of bank accounts, uh, that those remain in place. And that's always a very difficult thing to do. You know, so many of the people who are here today are here because of the president's trip to ask for that focus in you know, September, October, November is always going to be much more difficult. And so it, it, it's just, I think, the challenge uh, for us to try to keep uh, attention on these issues, even when the president is not uh, on the ground.
Thank you so much, such an interesting panel. Um, and I wanted to bring you back to some of these issues of health and rights and empowerment uh, to talk about the issues of women's health and empowerment, in particular women and girls. You mentioned the DREAMS initiative, you mentioned PEPFAR, um, the issues of women and girls and their uh, access to health services, their economic and uh, social empowerment, legal protection. Those are all underpinnings for the economic development and the security issues that you've touched on um, so so fully. So I wonder if you could address for a minute whether you think, especially given what the Obama administration has put in place in terms of strategies and policies and rhetoric on uh, moving forward the agenda on women and girls, do you expect that he will be raising this and weaving this in to these other important messages? And if not, why not? Hi, Mena Demisey with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I wanted to get back to Professor Lyon's question earlier about whether or not the counterterrorism strategies are sort of supporting or inhibiting stability. And when we talk about economic stability, it, it seems in large part Al-Shabaab's, one of their most successful strategies is capitalizing off of economic despair. So that at a very basic level, you have people who are sort of complicit in um, in uh, driving or at least sustaining corruption, uh, not because they have these ideological beliefs uh, one way or another, but because they're trying to get food on, on their plate. And so uh, my question has to do with sort of more of the long-term strategy of the US uh, putting pressure on um, uh, on, on you know, the governments both in Kenya and Ethiopia with regard to supporting long-term economic stability, which is very much fundamentally tied to political stability. So just seconding my sister's questions here in terms of participatory democracy and it's one thing to measure economic growth in terms of the number of buildings and uh, that are built and the roads that are uh, being built by the Chinese but when you talk about sort of the uh, masses profiting from economic growth in the country it becomes another question so I'm, I'm curious about the comments uh, you have in that regard. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. My name is Obang Meto uh, from Solidarity and Ethiopian Human Rights Organization. There's, uh, I would like to ask uh, Terran Lance, there's things that which is I would like you to allude to if you can. As you can tell in Ethiopia, recently, like a while ago, uh, International Crisis Group wrote a letter where they saying that Ethiopia was a time bomb in terms of ethnicities. And when you talk, you didn't mention that. Uh, for us, when we look at it, you know, as I think that the gentleman said, when, if you, when Obama went to Ghana, he said, what Africa needs is strong institution, not strong men. But now he has the chance to address the strong men when he go to, uh, to Addis. And also that as uh, the ambassador was saying that when he's in Kenya, he's going to meet with civil society. But in Ethiopia, civil society does not exist. In Terror Lands, you mentioned also about the land grab. And for me, I came from Gambela region of southwest of Ethiopia. For me, I don't call it a land grab. It's a life grab. When you take away the land, you take the life of those people. So in this case, we have an Ethiopian economic growth. It is an elite growth. Ethiopian boom, it is a few ethnic group booms. And it seems to be this what we hear, Ethiopian has been used as examples for the, you know, by the West or Darlin. And there's something which is missing, and I think Ambassador made it that. The US or Obama administration has failed to be on the side of the people, but to be on the side of the regimes. And then the side of the people is the side of the principle. What is it that can president do when he go there to make sure that his policy is not about a regime or not about you know, uh, autocratic regime, but it's about the people. So this is something that which I thought that, you know, about ethnicity in Ethiopia in the long run, if it's continue like this, it's going to explode. Right now, Ethiopia is screaming silence. It is a matter of time before it explodes. And if it does, again, all the things which has been dealt done in the last, in the past will be gone. So my question is the ethnicity part of it in Ethiopia. It's a few group that control in the country where the majority are suffering. Is that any way you think this could be addressed to the policymaker to the best that they will understand. In the long run, if they want stability on post of Ethiopia and East of Africa, they have to be on the side of the people, not on the side of autocratic regime. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and the gentleman here. And then uh, I think we're getting towards time. Hello, my name is Ryan Musser. I'm with the, <clears throat> the Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, I just I wanted to try and bring in the, the private sector into this conversation. 
um, in in Kenya uh, during leading up to uh, with the with the elections that um, in 2008 the private sector played a crucial role in in bringing peace during that time. Um, one of our partners, the the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, was very involved in that. Um, currently, we're working with a partner, uh, the Kenya uh, Association of Manufacturers, who are working with um, who are, who are working on. Uh, working with local governments to, to deal with security issues in, in Kenya. Um, and in Ethiopia, we're one of the only democracy groups that are, that are working in Ethiopia because we're working with chambers of commerce, which are not under the CSO law. Um, so there, I feel like there's a lot of space for the private sector to get involved in these issues that we talked about today. Um, so I'd love to hear how you think um, Obama on this trip uh, could utilize the local private sector to um, to deal with these issues. Great. Uh, okay, just a couple of quick points. In answer to Janet's question, is this issue going to be raised? Is this an important issue going to be raised? Uh, I'd, I'd say two things. One, I think there's probably perfect congruence between the government of Kenya and the government of the United States on these issues, and they would happily you know, could happily issue a statement talking about how they jointly um, uh, consider this to be a priority and it's something that we could work on together. Is this going to take up time or is this going to be discussed between President Obama and President Kenyatta? I'd say probably not. Why? Because, you know, consider that time management and controlling agendas is going to be very difficult during this visit. The president's going to have maybe, maybe an hour, maybe 90 minutes together with Kenyatta, maybe a couple of meals and some time on the margins of meetings. So it's going to be a real crush to deal with a whole series of regional, global, and some of these bilateral issues I mentioned earlier. Um, that's not to say that some sort of a statement couldn't be issued, or that this issue couldn't be part of a larger joint statement about where Kenya and the United States are working closely together, particularly on global, global health issues. Uh, and on the private sector part of it, uh, the, you know, the private sector is a big part of the success story, the recent economic success story in Kenya. The global entrepreneurship that the president is attending it will, in fact, showcase um, the, the, the role of the private sector. Uh, I think the president also wants to highlight how many American firms have relocated to Nairobi over the past five or six years, have made Nairobi th the hub of their expanding activities in Africa. So I expect that, that, that the, the role of the private sector will be uh, very visible, certainly at least during the visit to Kenya, and will be, will be part of this celebration of Kenya's economic success. Thank you, and thank you for all of your, your comments. The, the two that I maybe want to reflect on, Obang and my, uh, my friend from the, the Congressional Black Caucus, to me, come back to a kind of a long-term versus short-term agendas, which is a generic problem, a consistent problem with US foreign policy, is that the short-term, even often fiscal year or what's going to happen on this visit kind of agenda versus where do you want to be in 10 or 15 years. Very, very difficult for US policymakers to answer the question, where do you want this to look? What do you want the relationship to be like at 2030? And so that's that we may, and that's, I think, true everywhere around the world for decades. <laughs> so I don't think it's particularly uh, true here. A part of the challenge on this long term versus short term is this question that the way I raised it is that is the assumption that Ethiopia will be a force of stability, is that assumption, uh, does it need to be questioned? And the question again is in the short term, I actually think it probably likely is to be stable. It's a party, it's a strong man of strong institutions. One of the strongest institutions in Africa is the EPRDF. It's a party of seven million people with cadres in every single village, top down hierarchy, I didn't say democratic, you noticed, but a very, very strong institution that can get certain things done, particularly if they're top-down kind of, of things done. And I'm not, in, and so I think that in the short term, particularly so long as if they can keep a modicum reasonable levels of economic growth, is that they're likely to be sta uh, stable. I mean, that's the time bomb analogy, right? How long is the fuse? Well, we don't know. Is it one day? Is it 10 years? That's why the time bomb analogy doesn't 
get us at what we really need to know, and that is how, how far into the future should we be worried? Is this imminent or is this something we'll be talking about? My, uh, my, my friend David Throop is here, and we had this discussion in Ethiopia in 1995 on how long is this regime going to last. I mean, it was the, almost the exact same question of how long is the fuse. Well, you know, it lasted quite a while. Uh, it lasted the first 25 years. I don't, the next 25 years is, are going to be hard. Two very quick points. Um, one to um, my colleague from the CBC Foundation. Um, I'm not going to do it justice, but Mercy Corps recently put out a report. I don't know if you all saw it, but they were looking at the drivers of violent extremism, and they went in with the assumption that they would be primarily economic, social, political, um, and found that the number one driver was actually a sense of seeking accountability that they felt like the system in which they were operating, there was no accountability. So this goes back to all of these points that we've been making about security force, human rights abuses, and accountability for those. So just to add another layer to, to that narrative. And then on, on the site question, absolutely, I think the, 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 to echo what Ambassador Bellamy said, that the private investment is going to be at the heart of this visit. Um, you know, this narrative of Africa rising and of, you know, all of the opportunity for investment in Africa has become so pervasive, and I think in an attempt to counter the usual tropes about Africa, which I'm very thrilled to see that we're moving away from some of that, you know, development and poverty and conflict, that that's all we ever talk about. That said, it's not all rosy, right? And I think we're, we're sort of seeing that you know, some folks are saying it's not, we're not there yet, right? If you're looking at how Africans' lives are changing in a real way when it comes to economic development and growth, we have a long way to go. Well, I guess two, two quick points. One, to, to reiterate what, what Sarah to some degree said, is, is it certainly is, is our position that it's not poverty that drives jihadism. I think it's inequality that drives jihadism. It's this perception that um, certain communities are benefiting and others are not. And, and that's being exploited by jihadist groups. And, and it's, it's almost invariably not just religiously based, but it's also based on these local grievances that are very important in explaining where people are being recruited uh, in, in particular um, areas where religious conflict is prevalent. I mean, I think on, on the business issue, uh, I mean, clearly what, what's happening is that the United States caught on very, very late that there's this huge market in Africa that uh, so far uh, the Chinese and, and other Asian countries have been much more effective at exploiting. And, and it, you know, it, there has been a, a larger, I think, strategic project by the Obama administration that to some degree started with the Africa Summit last year and is being continued now with this visit to this entrepreneur conference to promote U.S. businesses to Africa and, and vice versa, to get U.S. businesses to recognize that there's lots of opportunities in Africa. I think that's a win-win. I think it's a win-win for U.S. businesses in the sense that they can make money. I think it's a win-win for Africa because um, obviously that does drive economic uh, growth. And as potentially what it does is it creates competition. It creates competition between Western firms and Chinese firms. And as everyone probably knows in this room, there's been some pushback in, um, in Africa in general uh, as to what Chinese firms particularly are doing. And I think that there are some areas, particularly when it comes to corporate responsibility and some other issues, where the United States actually has a competitive advantage uh, to, its com it, to other countries and other businesses. So I really think that that's a win-win, and, and it's logical for Obama to, to be pushing this and promoting this in, uh, in both Kenya and in, in Ethiopia. And that has ramifications not just for those two countries, but for the region as a whole. Uh, I think that, unfortunately, from our crisis group perspective, the one thing that is really holding back a real takeoff uh, for the region are these chronic wars that have not been resolved. And, and unless they resolve those chronic wars, um, that growth is going to be much more subdued. And once those wars are resolved, you will really see a takeoff in terms of growth. I mean, if you saw what was happening in Juba over the last four or five years after separation and before the, the collapse into war again, it was amazing how much money was being pumped into there. Uh, I mean, you go to Mogadishu and, and even the, there's all this mess uh, around the capital. There's a huge amount of money going into that 
into that city at the moment because uh, there's a lot of people who are very, very eager uh, to start businesses there, to, to restart their lives there, to, to get the economy going, and that should be supported. Just on that last note, I mean, the big challenge of this that comes across is getting the balance, I think, right. Uh, you know, I think the, the private sector uh, focus is important in policy terms, too. Um, ultimately, uh, you know, we don't get a lot of leverage from foreign assistance and kind of the PEP, whether it's PEPFAR or, 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 or other. Um, I think that kind of more ties more diverse ties between countries, including economic investment and trade relationships, uh, builds a stronger relationship and ultimately may give us greater leverage and influence uh, over the governments. Second is a, a middle class, uh, as we've seen, and, and, and the point was made, a, a growing middle class in these countries begins to exert pressure with with some autonomy because it has resources at command at its command and then and and the government needs that can begin to exert pressure in terms of rule of law contract sanctity um, and 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 privatization so I think there's beyond simply the trade <coughs> benefits of it I think there are policy benefits to it as well that may give the u s greater voice on other issues including governance and so forth. Um, Listen, I, I want to thank the panel, um, really excellent presentations, and the audience for really thoughtful um, questions and comments. Uh, we'll look forward to the trip and hopefully do a post-trip post analysis of, of what actually came of this. So thanks all very much. Post-mortem? No. <laughs> <laughs>